Welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. Here's your host, Tom Bourne. Hi, and welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. My name's Tom Bourne, your host. And with me today is Dr. Nectarius Karanikas. Uh, welcome. Um, now, Dr. Karanikas, should I say Nectarius? How would you like Nectarius? Nec- Nectarius. Yeah. You, you, you've done a lot. And at the moment, you're Associate Professor in, in Health, Safety and Environment at Queensland University of Technology. How is that treating you? Well, um, so far, so good. I have no regrets for moving from Europe to, to Australia and working for the Queensland University of Technology. We're not a huge team in the health, safety and environment, but a great work environment and, uh, you know, great collaboration and many things we do around. And how do you how do you find the students who are coming through? Are, are, are they as enthusiastic and as passionate about safety as you know I would expect them to be? We have a very diverse cohort of students. I think um, more than half, I, they are already health and safety professionals in the industry and they come to our courses to upskill. So they have a good understanding of the technical aspects mainly. What they find difficult sometimes is to demonstrates critical thinking and problem solving apart from following a procedure or, you know, um, simpler uh, activities, but they're doing well. And then we have students <clears throat> who want to switch career path. So they come from any background you can imagine, health professionals, agriculture, and they are really interested in health and safety and how they can help workplaces to improve. The difference with the previous group, the ones who work already in the industry, is that the second cohort is more open because they don't have a lot of experience or knowledge in health and safety, so they're more receptive. The first group, we need a bit more time with them to help them unlearn a few things and learn new things. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in safety and and how your professional career has led you to where you are? Yeah, sure. Um, I started as an aeronautical engineer in the Greek Air Force back in 1996. So after actually a few years, I was trained by the force as a health and safety officer or actually aviation safety officer to be more precise. I started getting involved in minor incident investigations, but and then I had a minor role as the ground safety officer in the squadron where I was serving. Nevertheless, um, I never saw safety back then as, you know, a career, as a trajectory. A few years later, I was sponsored by the Greek Air Force to study my Master's in Human Factors and Safety Assessment, which, um, to be honest, I didn't know what to expect. I liked the topic. I went through the units uh, offered. And as an engineer, I really wanted to understand how we can improve our lives, our working lives beyond technology, maintenance, quality management, and things like that. So after I graduated from my master's in Cranfield in the United Kingdom, I was appointed in the health and safety department of the Air Force. I was involved in many activities, um, including developing risk management frameworks, revising or publishing regulations and handbooks for health and safety, delivering lectures, training, uh, getting uh, involved in investigations also. After a few years, I started my doctorate uh, studies with uh, Middlesex University in safety and quality management. I had no plan back then to resign from the Air Force. I just started my doctorate because I got passionate with the topic. But after actually I finished, I graduated, um, I felt it was time to to switch career paths. Uh, actually, I switched industry and 
resigned from the Greek Air Force and went to the Netherlands as associate professor in aviation safety and human factors. So I stayed there for four years and a half. Then I felt I needed something more challenging, maybe far away from Greece. I was very reachable um, in the Netherlands. So here I am in early 2019 in Australia and the Queensland University of Technology. Excellent. Human factors, human factors. Hear a lot about it in safety in the last few years. But what's it about? Um, and more importantly, how does it relate to workplace safety? Simply put, human factors have to do with the interactions of ourselves, of humans, with other humans, the technology, and the environment, including natural environment, infrastructure, the social environment and organizational environment. So it's about interactions, if I would put it in one word. Although we connect human factors with safety many times, just because we are health and safety professionals, human factors are not only about safety, are about human performance. And humans perform not just to deliver safety, they, they perform the jobs to deliver outcomes, including quality, including security, safety, efficiency, sustainability, whatever objectives we have. Excellent. All right. Now, you've done a fair bit of work in the past in the, uh, well, in the aviation industry. It was a, a recent recent uh, report on ABC about... Uh, I don't know, an airline in particular, we won't mention the one, um, and perhaps potential safety issues that uh, may occur. Airlines are traditionally seen as high resilience organisations, but most airlines have the competing priorities of being always on time as well as being safe. How do organisations who have those conflicting uh, policies or conflicting uh, priorities actually successfully manage them? I don't think that in aviation those priorities are conflicting. That's the secret here. They don't see safety and operations as separate entities. We're talking about safe operations. Now, aviation has learned through huge disasters and catastrophes in, in the past. And different to other industry sectors, it's quite standardized across the globe. So for a company to be viable in the international arena, we're talking about big names, international companies, there is this mutual recognition of standard practices and systems that they must have in place. So be so to be allowed actually to fly over specific regions. So if you know Qantas from here needs to fly over Europe has been approved and certified by the European Union, the, the regulator there that has the standards here that ensure that they will not harm anyone in, in the region. The I will give you an example how they really achieve safe operations. What's the difference, let's say, with construction or manufacturing? A health and safety professional in construction, like the head, the head of a health and safety department, is in the headquarters, sits in the office, collaborates with his staff or her staff, line management, supervisors, team members, whoever, in the structure. In aviation, you will rarely find an, health, an aviation safety manager who does only safety management. They are at the same time pilots, they are the same time flight crews, at the same time engineers and maintenance staff. So what happens is that they work for the safety department three days a week and then they fly the other two days a week. So whatever they do, they feel it, the experience, which is a huge difference from the other industries. Yeah. And, you know, you understand that when you are health and safety professional and you do the work or you supervise the work, 
um, which you are supposed to monitor and help and you know support with your device, it's far more effective than just communicating policies, procedures, concerns, instructions, or whatever. Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, I noticed in, in the Australian context in particular that there seemed to be a move away from the use of a particular word called accidents. And uh, instead, we started using this term incidents. And I, I didn't understand it at the time, but a wise person once said to me, it's because that accidents have this implication that they're uncontrolled and they're beyond anyone's control. They're just, you know, bound to happen. Whereas incidents suggested that all uh, all negative events, shall we say, uh, can be controlled and uh, possibly preventable. Are they? To say that um, accidents would uh, happen nevertheless, a bit fatalistic. On the other hand, to say that all incidents could have been prevented, um, it is maybe delusion. Yes, after the fact, when you look at what happened, you could say, ah, you could have done this or that or that. This doesn't mean that you will prevent the new, another event in the future. Not a single event happens under the same conditions, the same circumstances. Traditionally, the differentiation between incidents and accidents have to do with the severity. So if we had fatalities, we, we have an accident or huge damage when we didn't have serious injuries or fatalities, we name them incidents or serious incidents, the classifications out there. But I will get back to this controlled thing you said. We did a study three, four years ago in aviation, and we found that even incidents were uncontrolled, meaning that they just happened and the end user, the operator, mm -hmm. didn't have the chance to intervene. Um, so we still have events where the outcome was not determined by any control of the system. In the accident case, that was more frequent. So we have about 30% of accidents non-controlled by the end user and about 7% only of the incidents without any attempt by the end user to intervene. But in, in both cases, we had uncontrolled conditions. The question is here, why something is uncontrolled? And for the cases that the end user controlled in the case in, in the sense that intervened attempted to to rectify you know a problem an issue how successful this intervention was and how we compare that so those classifications do not have any meaning if we don't connect them with what to do next if we classify things so that to justify ourselves not to action something, then I would not endorse any of those classifications. If we endorse classifications to prioritize actions, should we focus on serious incidents or incidents, and then if we have good criteria to prioritize, I would support those types of definitions. But traditional ones more, um, I know in vocabulary, accident means something like bad luck. Yep. But in the health and safety, it's not about bad luck. Most of the time, it's about the severity that we, we really had a very uh, bad outcome. That's yeah. at least the language we, we use. Yeah. Language is a, it, it, it is a really powerful, um, a powerful thing when we use safety because some practitioners grab hold of a, a term or a phrase and, and, and they... They use it so literally. Um, and this goes into even safety campaigns that happen at workplaces. Um, I've got to be honest and say, I, I've, I, I see some progress that we're moving away from some mindless sort of meaningless safety slogans in the workplace. But even today, 
I see advertised health and safety advisory positions where we have organisations using this interesting terminology of zero harm, aiming towards zero. Parts of their 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 culture is saying that all accidents are preventable. Um, is there any negative consequences for organisations who actually use these phrases and these slogans? Uh, in in the culture of the workplace? I don't believe, Tom, that anything is inherently bad or good. It's how you use it. Yeah. The problem with all those zero harm, you know, um, slogans, is that they started as visions and they didn't remain visions. So when you start transforming your vision into goals and plans and you attach numbers, then it becomes a problem. So myself, I don't see any problem if somebody says, we have a vision for a peaceful world. It's nice, isn't it? Should we have wars? No. Now, that's a vision and remains a vision. We always have had wars. So the same I think applies with the zero harm. It's, it's like a dream we have. It's like something we would like, the ideal situation and condition. We know we cannot achieve it 100%. And we should leave it as there. So when you make your vision, then you decompose it and you put numbers and goals and actions to, you don't leave it as a vision, then it becomes an outcome. It becomes an objective itself. And this now generates problems because in my organization, whatever the objective, if I don't contribute to this objective, it means that I'm an impediment. I'm a problem for the organization. So similarly, if we say zero harm is a goal, not just a vision, and we measure it, if I, injure, I get injured for any reason, I feel bad. Because I'm the reason for ruining the numbers of my manager and the vision, or the goal, not the vision of the organization. So I'm getting back to what you said before about the power of the language and what we do with that. I don't say vision visions are bad once more, but when we misuse visions and we transform them into goals and plans and numbers, it becomes a problem. And, you know, we talk about zero harm vision, okay? On the other hand, the other campaigns, the no one blamed vision. Don't we have the no one blamed vision in health and safety? Is it harmful? As a vision, what do you think? Could be. No, no one to blame. Uh, look, there has to it's be. It's a vision, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it's a nice idea, but... Um... I mean, I'm 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 for looking at underlying conditions and the environment that leads to uh, certain incidents happening, but I still think there has to be some level uh, of accountability. We can't Good. have recklessness as being adopted as the norm and being accepted. So the vision can remain there. This does not mean that the specific actions and goals and plans we have that we 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 can achieve the no one blame vision, which I personally see, not just feel, it's not no one blame vision, it's more shifting the blame. Because it's very fair, of course, not to focus on the operators and uh, blame people. But now I have seen shifting the blame to line managers, to senior management, to, to yes. boards. And this is not productive. Yeah, there's there's a, there's a few things around it. I mean, I I look at that whole no blame, and you're right. It all, there seems to be an investigation, some sort of throwaway lines. First of all, the old vision, which is we blame the operator, but the newer vision is now. You're right. We we blame the supervisor or the manager, or we use this thing that it's defective culture, and we stop there because they're just throwaway lines. Unless you actually go a bit further. Um, yeah. I, I I think there's a great deal more in-depth understanding that you've got to do before you could 
you know, reach an outcome in an investigation. And we should also separate the functions between human resources and health and safety. Yeah. I don't think that health and safety has any powers to <laughs> to blame or, you know, to penalize people. And we should do not once more uh, when we don't have recklessness, you know, any uh, behavior like this. To me, we must be careful with the language once more and do not those uh, those visions not creating unintentional side effects. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we move from a name and blame and same culture to something more productive? Yeah. The ask or make decision can ask themselves, how would they like to be treated? Should they have been in the same situation under the same conditions and the same amount of resources? But first, you've For got example. to know what those conditions and resources yeah. are before you can you can even put that question. And they have another proposition also. I mean, I I, I seen many statements report nectarios did not push the button. Okay, that's caused the accident. This is not a productive statement to make. I would say nectarios, while subject to conditions X did something instead of what we were expecting him to do for the system that we design for conditions Z. <laughs> I don't know if I'm confusing you. No, no, no. If, if we for... counterfactual arguments. Yeah, yeah. So if we formulate those actions, behaviors that we believe that are linked to something negative, mm -hmm. and we say, Somebody, while subject to conditions, specific conditions, did something instead of something else that we designed for another set of conditions, then we have so many opportunities, Tom, to change the system and not blame yeah. people. There's something I just want to go back to. When you were talking about visions and goals, the thing I find even worse in transferring visions to goals is then when goals become incentivized with the use of, let's be honest, reward, rewards, let's, let's be honest. And I still see this happening in very large industries across Australia where financial bonuses are given for achieving a goal, which was actually a vision to start with. And so it's incentivizing not reporting or not reporting injuries or incidents or near misses, because if we do that, either a supervisor misses out on a financial payment or the whole team misses out on a financial payment and no one wants to be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. I think it misses the whole point that we're supposed to encourage the reporting. We're supposed to encourage notifications because if things aren't reported, you usually only find out when there's a major incident or accident that actually happens that something's wrong. Um. <sighs> I must also say, um, in the last few years, I've, I've heard a lot about, as safety practitioners, we there is this distinction between policy and procedure and, and real work, a bit about how work is imagined mm. by people who write the policies and procedures and how work is actually carried out in reality. We're also told that we have to approach uh, situations in, in the workplace with a curious mind. Can you actually give some some basic guidance how a frontline safety officer is to practically apply curiosity and that sort of mindset of, you know, trying to work out real work done in its reality as opposed to work as imagined may actually help them? Yes, Tom. I will start with a comment about those versions, work as imagined and work as done. Personally, I don't find them very useful. I have used them in my teaching and my publications. But the more I'm thinking about them, um, the more I am inclined to adapt another version. I, why? You know, we can have many versions. Yes, as imagined, work as planned, 
well, uh, work as documented, work as coded, work as translated, work as encoded, work as perceived, work whatever. Yep. Now, the work as done, work as imagined is a gap which carries negative connotations. So my colleagues who coined this team are the ones who claim we should focus on positives, the same persons. And now, you know, so it's something controversial. I mean, you know, you say we should focus on positives, but on the other hand, we have gaps. We should close the gaps, which a gap is a negative thing in management terminology. So my approach would be to have another version work as agreed and work as possible which i think includes it's more positive than work as done and work as imagined it includes the agreement that there must be a consultation must be an honest discussion between the avian all stakeholders the end users supervisors line management and so on and work as possible entails the conditions that we encounter and the capacity we have to deal with work demands, conditions, and so on. Thoughts, my humble proposition to, um, you know, the work as imagined, work as done has its value, trigger those discussions, as you said before, but maybe we should rethink. Yeah. yeah. Now, Regarding the, the curiosity uh, thing, I don't think that curiosity should be a trait only of any health and safety professional. Mm -hmm. And um, although I think sometimes that several safety staff colleagues have an identity confusion, so what am I supposed to do in an organization? What powers and authorities I have? What is my role? My understanding is that we are workers first of all in you know in legislation we don't have any other role with us workers and who have the responsibility they have the role to provide advice information support insights across the whole organization from the end user to, up to the board ceo whoever, whoever is that about how to manage Two things, interactions, go back to human factors, <coughs> excuse me, and exposures. I think that we, safety professionals focus too much on processes like investigations, audits, risk assessments, and we don't understand that everything we have in our organization should ideally focus first on eliminating or minimizing harmful exposures and interactions. That will be the first, which is a goal. You, you talked about goals before. And if we have the resources and capacity, our next contribution to the organization would be how to maximize beneficial exposures and interactions. So the first one to minimize harmful has to do with mainly physical and mental health and safety, to maximize good exposures and interactions have to do with the well-being. This is how I see the role of safety professionals, and those things could be goals and should be goals in an organization. If you have investigations, if you have audits, if you have education, if you have meetings, you have reviews, and they do not serve the goal of minimizing or eliminating bad exposures and interactions physically and socially, mentally, then those processes do not serve health and safety. I hope I'm clear enough. No, absolutely. All right. Um, you've got, you come from the unique position of not originating in Australia. So I, I think this is a good question for you. Um, you've come to Australia and Therefore, you've had to learn Australian legislation as it applies to health and safety here. In your opinion, is the legislative framework we currently operate in Australia 
the enforcement and compliance measures that we have in place and the penalties for breaching that legislation appropriate? I don't see, Tom, any huge differences from other developed countries. More or less, Australia follows practices in Europe, in the United Kingdom, Canada, uh, in the US, and so on. So I wouldn't say, in principle, that Australia is misaligned. Now, I, I'm not a legal professional. So as a citizen... Uh, as a resident, actually, in Australia, not yet a citizen. To me, it's not a question about whether the legislation is appropriate, because legislation, theoretically, to a large degree, expresses the public. That's, that's how the system works. We have democracy here, and we have structures to debate uh, about legislation to receive feedback about the draft, uh, you know, legislative pieces, and then going through a nice process of debate and then passing the laws. The challenge is not about the regulation and the acts. It is about how those are enacted through policies and how they are applied in the courts. So it's more about how we interpret the legislation and the regulations and not the document themselves, I mean, the law there. And regulators want to be proactive. I don't think that there's any regulator in Australia that says we should only be reactive. But if they don't have the resources and capacity to to be proactive, then we see them as only the bad in, in quotes, yep. patients that come to a workplace after a serious injury or any other issue goes reported, and we say, uh, you know, they're reactive, which I don't support uh, because regulators try to reach out businesses. They have so many um, resources up there. I would say, on the other hand, that it's very difficult to reach out to everyone, especially individual-based, you know, trade companies, small companies, medium-sized um, companies. There are thousands of them around each state and territory. And although this might look like they they use they they publish resources and support and they cannot really reach out to Avrian might sound a bit, um, um, how to say, ineffective. Mm -hmm. in, in reality, we, we must see that in the context. How many people we have there, yeah. um, how much they can do with the time that they have. And I believe they do a good job. Yeah. It's the organization now that needs to have policies where it interprets the law correctly. And this is how we educate the future health and safety professionals in QQT. And one of the topics they find difficult is the occupation health and safety law and policy. Yeah. All right. Uh, just one more question we have time for. Uh, you teach at QUT. Uh, you teach the uh, graduate diploma in, in health and safety. Tell me, what's the benefits for existing health and safety practitioners to continue to learn and grow through formal qualifications? The, the real benefits have to do with a problem-solving, critical thinking and inquisitive mind where you don't focus on one health and safety area alone. You don't solve a problem through a specific narrow path, but you try to integrate approaches, practices, paradigms, and examples, best practices from different areas. So when we start with uh, new students during the orientation, I always say there is no value to be very good in health and safety law and policy, which we did, 
or in ergonomics or in toxicology and hygiene or in occupational health and so on. The secret for a successful health and safety professional is how to connect all those concepts, to integrate all those approaches and, and knowledge to support organizations with sustainable, with viable, with effective collaborative actions. All right. We might have to leave it there today. Thank you so much, Dr. Nectorius Karanikas, for being on the show. I really do appreciate your time today. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thanks very much for the invitation, Dom. All the best. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Health and Safety Conversations with Tom Bourne. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your week.